Welcome members and guests to the Oregon Ninth Program at the City Club of Eugene, Police Profiling, Oregon's Effort to Stop It. Thank you for joining us. I'm James Baldock, City Club President. Our sponsors today are Oregon Country Fair, July 8th, 9th, and 10th, 2016, Friends and Neighbors Realty, Realty, Realty Low-Key, No Pressure, Real Estate Sales and Consulting, and Pack Info Internet Solutions. Special thanks go to KPFF Consulting Engineers for supplying our office space, and to KLCC Radio for airing these programs at 6.30 on Monday nights, and for archiving the podcasts on their sites. A quick reminder that we host nearly 50 original nonpartisan issue programs every year, and today is our fifth program in our 2015-2016 programming year. If you believe with us that civic engagement is the lifeblood of democracy, please join us. We welcome donors, sponsors, members, volunteers, and students, anyone who has a stake in community life. Today's program, Police Profiling, Oregon's Effort to Stop It, is coordinated, coordinated by John DeWinter, who will be introducing the speakers. Thank you, James. Law and order probably is the most important service governments provide their citizens. At the same time, equal protection and due process under the law are cornerstones of our Constitution. You might think these values or principles would clash over the issue of police profiling. However, no such clash occurred when the Oregon legislature earlier this year considered the law that is the subject of today's program. Instead, Kevin Campbell, the executive director of the Oregon Association of Chiefs of Police, was emphatic in his statement to the legislature that biased policing is not professional policing. Accordingly, Mr. Campbell offered to work with the proponents of the proposed law to address the police chief's concerns about it. I think we'll see the same spirit of cooperation in our speakers today, Dave Fedanke and Eugene Police Chief Pete Kearns, as they discuss the new law and the challenges posed in implementing it. Both speakers are members of the state committee responsible for overseeing the law's implementation. Dave Fedanke was executive director of the American Civil Liberties Union of Oregon from 1993 until he retired this year. He joined the ACLU of Oregon staff in 1982 as its associate director in Eugene and worked for the organization for a total of 33 years. In March 2013, he received the ACLU of Oregon's highest honor, the E.B. McNaughton Civil Liberties Award, commemorating his 20th anniversary as executive director. It may surprise you that Dave is not an attorney. Rather, he was trained as a news reporter, receiving his master's in journalism at UC Berkeley in 1974. Initially pursuing this career, he worked for KEZI-TV and KZEL-FM in Eugene as a reporter in the mid-1970s. Pete Kearns has served the City of Eugene Police Department for more than 30 years. He began as a reserve officer in 1981 and since then has advanced to a patrol officer, a detective, a sergeant, a lieutenant, and a commanding officer before assuming his current position as chief of police in October 2008. Over the course of his career, his responsibilities have included the, the field training of other officers supervising the Lane County Interagency Narcotics Enforcement Team, and leading the Special Weapons and Tactics Team, also known as the SWAT Team. He is and has been a strong supporter of neighborhood-based community policing. Please welcome Dave Fedenke and Chief Pete Kearns. So I'll go first, Dave Fedenke here, uh, for those in the listening audience. And um, I'm going to sketch out some of the background uh, in Oregon related to profiling. And the chief is going to talk about the new legislation and how it's being implemented. 
and some of the issues um, here in Eugene. I came to this issue um, of racial and ethnic profiling because of my work with the ACLU. And um, in the early 1990s, we learned of a drug interdiction program that the Oregon State Police was doing that was having a disproportionate impact on Latino drivers on Oregon State highways. Uh, what we learned was that uh, the state police were operating on the assumption that drugs coming were coming north from Mexico and Southern California into Oregon and that the proceeds from those drug sales were going south. And as a result, they were doing an aggressive program of consent searches of vehicles that were stopped for traffic violations, both northbound vehicles and southbound vehicles. And they believed that most of the people who were involved in the drug trade were Latino. Um, there was a certain amount of truth to that um, that, that can't be denied. Um, but what we found when we asked the state police to go through their data uh, was that they were seizing cash from Latinos going south, uh, even if there was no evidence of illegal drugs in the vehicles. And um, at that time, uh, a fair number of migrant workers uh, would spend summers and falls in Oregon and then head south with their earnings. They didn't have bank accounts. And so those earnings were in cash. And some of the amounts that the state police were seizing and keeping under Oregon civil forfeiture laws at the time uh, were relatively small amounts of cash, $1,000, $2,000, $3,000. Uh, sometimes it was large amounts of cash, uh, but in many cases, we believed in the ACLU that these people were actually innocent of crim any criminal activity and had merely been in the wrong place at the wrong time. And when we asked the state police involved in this program, I believe it was five officers who were most active in it, to go back through their notebooks and tabulate all of their traffic stops and all of the cases where they had done uh, searches of vehicles, what we found was a clear disproportionate impact. They were pretty good at identifying white drivers who were involved in criminal activity. I think in 55% of the cases uh, where they did searches, they found evidence of criminal activity, um, in, and in many cases, uh, drugs, illegal drugs. But the Latino drivers, um, number one, were more likely to be subjected to searches, and the police were less likely to find evidence of criminal activity uh, and, uh, or, and or cash, which the police believed was evidence of illegal activity, set aside for a moment uh, whether or not there really was illegal activity. And to their credit, once the state police uh, were faced with this data, they changed the program um, and made major changes to, uh, to their program. That was the start of uh, some of the work on racial and ethnic profiling in Oregon. Um, and that work has continued for many years. Uh, in 2001, the legislature created the Law Enforcement Contacts Policy and Data Review Committee, known as the LECC for short, or the Law Enforcement Contacts Committee, uh, of which both, as, as John said, both Chief Kearns and I serve on that committee. I've been on it since the beginning. And, um, you know, it's, it, it has a number of law enforcement representatives as well as representatives 
of community organizations and the community at large. What we found in talking uh, in conversations between community organizations and law enforcement over the last two decades in Oregon, two and a half decades in Oregon, is that um, everyone is, is opposed to discrimination. No police officer in Oregon um, believes that they're engaging in intentional discrimination against anyone. Certainly not any that is in violation of the law or the Constitution. But there have been disproportionate impacts. And those agencies that have collected stop data um, have, have seen that disproportionate impact over time. Trying to explain why there's a disproportionate impact gets very complicated. And um, I think the most important thing has been for the data collection to prompt conversations. For example, as with the state police data, uh, data in Corvallis and uh, Hillsborough and state police data has shown uh, pretty dramatic differences in the results of searches carried out on African Americans and Latinos. Um, is that because of preconceived notions about uh, the vehicles driven by those individuals? Is that because of other factors? We've been trying to get to the bottom of that uh, in the LECC for years now, and uh, we'll probably continue to try to get to the bottom of it for years to come. Every law enforcement agency in Oregon has policies that prohibit racial and ethnic profiling. And Chief Kearns will talk about the policies here in Eugene. But policies and procedures of police agencies in Oregon are designed to comply with the law and the Constitution and to basically give police officers as much discretion as possible within the law and within the Constitution to find and arrest people who are committing crimes and to prevent crimes as much as possible. That's not an easy job. We know from the headlines over the past year around the country uh, that uh, individual incidents can spin out of control very, very quickly. You're all familiar with the name of Michael Brown and his death at the hands of police in Ferguson, Missouri. Uh, you may be familiar with the name of Eric Garner, who died uh, after an encounter with police in Staten Island, New York. And you may know the name of Freddie Gray, who died after an encounter with police in Baltimore, Maryland. Closer to home, we've had people who have died after encounters with the police. There was a story on the front page of our newspaper just this morning about a tragic incident this year here in Eugene. All of us who care about law enforcement, all of us who care about civil and constitutional rights, and I include in that police officers and police chiefs and sheriffs want to prevent those kinds of incidents from happening. And yet, they continue to happen. And too often, uh, the people who die are people of color. Most law enforcement officials in um, our communities in Oregon did not believe that racial and ethnic profiling is a problem here in our state. They believe that they are unfairly tarnished because of high profile incidents that have happened elsewhere or at most incidents in the Portland area. I would submit to you 
that as long as we have uh, disproportionate impacts on people of color in our state, in our community, as long as there is a lack of trust between communities of color and our law enforcement agencies, and I'd be happy to cite data to back up uh, that issue, as long as African Americans who live in our community, as long as Latinos who live in our community know from their life experience that they are treated differently when they come into contact with police. As long as um, parents of color have to educate their children about how to survive an encounter with police without being killed, we have a problem and a problem that has to be addressed seriously, not just by law enforcement and not just by communities of color, but by all of us. I'll stop there for now. Well, it's an interesting phenomenon that when a police officer stops a person of color and the, and the person that they stop believes that they've been stopped because of their race, the police officer at the same time is just as confident that race had nothing to do with the reason for the stop. And so it's difficult to understand how two intelligent people can have completely different beliefs about an encounter without the data that we need to better understand it. And we know a few things about human nature now uh, involving implicit bias, and we know more about how society's uh, has contributed to uh, the problem and our failure to address certain things. But the Oregon State Legislature has enacted this House bill, House Bill 2002 this year, to help us uh, get our arms around it a little bit better than we have in the past. And so the new bill defines, it does a number of things. The first thing it does is it defines profiling and uh, identifies a comprehensive list of factors that would fall into the category of uh, profiling. And uh, profiling is, uh, is defined, and I won't read it all, but it, it says that uh, suspicion that uh, a person is targeted by a police officer based solely on the real or perceived factor, and then it lists the factors. Solely is a pretty, t to say that a police officer would stop one, someone only because of their race uh, is a pretty narrow number of contacts that police in the United States might have, and uh, arguably it would be so rare it may never happen, uh, except by someone who is intentionally racist and contacting people only because of their race and is aware of that. Our definition in our uh, and our uh, policy for biased policing is uh, primary, if, if they're stopped primarily for uh, race. And I'll, I'll go into that in a little bit. And the list of factors include is pretty broad. So most of our uh, policies in Oregon, most police policies, will need to be uh, edited, modified. It includes age, race, ethnicity, color, national origin, language, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, political affiliation, religion, homelessness, or disability. And so this, these are the other things that it does. It requires that police departments and their policies and procedures clearly prohibit profiling. It requires that each of us have a procedure for receiving complaints about profiling, investigating those complaints, and reporting to the LECC about the complaints and, and our findings from those investigations. It also requires that the LECC establish a method of receiving complaints, and that had to be done by October 1st, and the LECC has finalized a form that can be uh, found online for making complaints to that organization. And then the LECC must forward those complaints to the involved police agency, which uh, must re uh, complete an investigation within a certain amount of time and return the findings to the LECC. It also prohibits uh, public sharing of the identities of the complainant and the identities of the involved police officer. The, the uh, stat new statute also establishes a working group to, uh, uh, with a certain task that I'll mention here in a minute. And the working group is made up of 10 members. Three of the members are 
identified or assigned by the President of the Senate, three by the Speaker of the House of Representatives, three by the Governor, and then the tenth is, is the Chair who is, will be a member of the Oregon Department of Justice. The purpose of this committee is to propose a process to identify patterns and practices of profiling from around the state. And the hope is that by receiving complaints from local agencies about profiling and by receiving complaints at the LECC, we'll have a little bit clearer picture of where profiling is occurring that would help us to identify what its cause might be. And then the, the panel must also identify methods and, proce and process to correct profiling issues and then prepare a report that would identify what legislative changes could be enacted in order to, uh, in order to uh, require certain uh, conduct or procedures or policies within police departments. And then the last thing that the statute does is that it funds the LECC. Uh, so many government agencies are established and given responsibility without the financing to do it. And so for the next biennium, there's about a quarter of a million dollars the LECC can do to carry out its mission. The Eugene Police Department has done a few things. Uh, in September of uh, 2014, we finalized a policy that was developed, uh, that was recommended first by the Police Commission and then modified slightly by my command staff and approved by me. And it, sh is, it has, as I mentioned earlier, a, a, a prohibition on, on biased policing uh, in which race or gender, national origin uh, are and others are a primary motivator, which is the modern um, definition used in law enforcement for um, profiling. And we already have a system in place. We have a uh, well-developed and well-functioning and respected and credible uh, civilian oversight system in Eugene with an independent police auditor that reports to um, the uh, city council. So we have a way to receive complaints. We have a, a way to review complaints. There's a quality control system over every complaint that's investigated. And so now the only thing that we'll need to add is a reporting to the LECC, which we can do easily. And then we'll also need to add the factors to our policy in the definition of bias policing that are not presently included but required by uh, the new statute. Uh, we also, uh, a little more than a year ago, established a work group to help us, developed a, help us to develop a pilot project for collecting data uh, from the, in the Eugene Police Department. And uh, that group included uh, broad uh, representation from our community. Uh, the ch the co-chairs were Captain Sam Kamkar, who's a very interesting individual in our agency. He's, uh, he and his family migrated from Iran shortly about the time of the fall of uh, the Shah. His father was a um, high-ranking official in the military, and they came to the United States and um, suffered extreme poverty and found their way out, and Sam has worked his way up through our organization, has been a very impressive contributor. And then retired Lane County Judge Kip Leonard. Uh, two members of our police union were on the board, one of our police officers, the police auditor was on this panel, uh, the executive director of CALC, Michael Kerrigan, U of O professor Edward Ol Ol Olivos, LCC diversity coordinator, the Lane ESD diversity coordinator, a uh, parole and probation officer who's also a representative of blacks in government, the NAACP president who was uh, Eric Richardson, and uh, the Bethel School District coordinator. And they helped to develop the pilot project that we'll be putting in place that we'll be initiating in a couple of weeks and also identified the um, stops data that we would be collecting on discretionary traffic stops that officers are making. The, uh, uh, when we purchased a new record, electronic rec records management system a few years ago and that went in place, it, had, it included a feature that allowed us to collect data. Unfortunately, that, the vendor has had a difficult time making that available to us. And so, uh, frustrated with this, we went to uh, an IT uh, engineer with our public works department who developed an iPhone app uh, that will do exactly what we needed it to and we'll be able to roll that out with 12 volunteer police officers, as I said, in just a couple of weeks. Uh, and the, uh, the data that we'll be collecting will be the officer's ID, the time of the stop, the initial purpose of the stop, uh, any enforcement action that was taken, the age, race, sex, ethnicity of the driver, the number of passengers, those same uh, demographics of any passengers that were um, that were interviewed or contacted or uh, searched by the officer, the reason for the search, the authority to conduct the search, uh, and uh, any contraband if it, that was located, if any. 
And then we've also uh, required that all of our officers attend training that helps them to understand uh, implicit bias and its effect on humans and uh, how to make good uh, judgment, use good judgment, make good decisions uh, when enforcing the law. And we're providing refresher training on implicit bias now. Uh, the, the police agencies in the United States that have done well in this arena have partnered uh, effectively with uh, universities and colleges. And we've been really lucky to work with Dr. Charles Martinez in the, uh, at the University of Oregon in the Department of Education. And an associate of his, Professor Eric uh, Gervin, who's developed an implicit bias program uh, that was initially intended for educators, and, uh, but he has modified for a presentation to our department, which we'll receive later this year. So we're looking forward to the initiation of our pilot project, which I'd be happy to talk about if you have questions and how that'll proceed. And, uh, and thank you very much for allowing us to speak here today. And thank you both. Uh, our first questioner today is Juan Carlos Valle. Juan Carlos is a native of Mexico. He is the founding president of the Lane County Council of the League of Latin, United Latin American Citizens, also known as LULAC which is the largest and oldest Latino civil rights advocacy group in this country. He is a former chair of the Eugene Police Commission, and he is president-elect of this club, the Eugene City Club. Juan Carlos. Thank you, John, and the City Club for hosting this uh, very important panel on a very, very important subject that really has taken a lot of interest throughout Oregon. The League of United Latin American Citizens, as you know, was founded in 1929. The mission of LULAC is to advance the economic condition, educational attainment, political influence, housing, health, and of course, civil rights of the Latino population in the United States, including Puerto Rico. LULAC strongly condemns racial profiling and supports a strong statutory definition of racial profiling. And we have concerns of the exclusionary, non-transparent, and meaningless, and reliable pilot institutional data collection systems by law enforcement. Nevertheless, we welcome any approach that would bring both transparency and accountability to the work law enforcement does. We are cautiously optimistic on this piece of legislature. We believe that it will bring some level of accountability. My question to the two of you, and Chief Kearns, thank you for being here. Mr. Fidanke, same for your, all the many hours you're giving to our community. My question actually includes both accountability and monitoring. So assuming you will let people know about the new complaint mechanism. Who investigates and what happens if and when you see a pattern of profiling? Second part of the question is on the monitoring. What type of reliable system do you recommend to be created so corrective action for officers found to be profiling can be implemented? By the way, I was very involved in the local policy as when I was on the police commission. And there was a lot of issues in going into the policy, including Chief Kern's uh, decision to handpick those individuals and in fact embed that committee into police commission, which we approved and I also voted to approve it. But there's a lot of issues, including uh, you know, what happens, who, who participates, and whether or not the results are published, who gets to analyze it. It was a very exclusionary uh, committee, but nevertheless, we respect that. If you want me to repeat the question, I will. Thank you so much. Shall I go first, Chief? Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks, Juan Carlos. Um, let, me, let me start by pointing out two things. In terms of accountability around the legislation, uh, a lot of that still needs to be worked out. Um, there, as far as I know, there are only two jurisdictions in Oregon that have any form of civilian review 
of police misconduct complaints, Portland and Eugene. Um, and my understanding um, from talking to staff with uh, the LACC this week is that Portland believes that they receive about 100 complaints a year of uh, incidents that they think will fit the, de the new definition and will need to be reported. <coughs> um, I don't know how many there are in Eugene. In Portland, um, complaints are received by the Office of Independent Police Review, uh, which is under the city auditor's office in Portland. Uh, of course, we have um, an independent police auditor as well under our city charter in Eugene. Um, and, but in every other jurisdiction in Oregon besides Portland and Eugene, uh, the, any complaints are made directly to the Internal Affairs Division of that police department or sheriff's office. Um, you know, I've, I've been a proponent of civilian oversight for a long time. Uh, I think it works, the, a well-designed system can improve things greatly. But we have to remember that, and one of the reasons it's so important we have the police commission in Eugene, is that in, in so many incidents, in the vast majority of incidents, where there, um, the actions of the officer are consistent with existing policy, are consistent with the existing law, are consistent with the Constitution. But in many cases, those incidents bring to light changes that need to be made to the policy, which has been the critical role that's been played by the police commission in Eugene and why we advocated for a separate body from the Civilian Oversight Committee to be involved in, in policy review. Unfortunately, not very many jurisdictions have that kind of a system in place. So I think there are opportunities that we have here in Eugene for improvement that um, unfortunately we don't have in other jurisdictions that, that need to adopt similar kinds of practices. As far as the uh, accountability for the complaint process itself, it's one, one thing that the Chief didn't mention, in addition to the fact that the LACC will be able to receive complaints directly, it will be possible to make complaints anonymously. So a third party witness to an incident can make a complaint about an incident um, that could then be investigated by the police department involved. Um, there are limitations on how far, account, uh, you know, how far an anonymity is gonna be useful um, if it's the actual person who was involved in the incident. Because obviously if you complain about an incident, date and time, uh, and place, uh, the police agency is going to know who was involved. So um, there, there are a lot of kinks that need to be worked out as this rolls out, um, and um, there are a lot of improvements that need to be made in the whole accountability process overall. The, um, you know, the interesting thing about implicit bias is that we all have them, and uh, we don't most of us don't know what they are. And so I think the, the, the healthiest approach to addressing um, trends that show bias in policing is to have good training so that officers understand uh, what their biases are and how they're affecting their decision making, and, uh, and then good data collection. And the police departments that are doing this effectively will follow up with those officers, bring their trend, if, if there's a trend that they uh, have a disproportionate number of contacts by race or other factor, and, uh, and find out why and, uh, and work with them. And of course, if it's an intentional act, that's something that should be disciplined, disciplined and perhaps lead to termination. Uh, but I think in most cases, all of our biases that affect all of our decisions are unintended and we probably wish they weren't affecting us. So. Uh, good training and good follow-up and good data collection. 
City Club members, please identify yourselves and keep your questions to about 30 seconds each. Karen Seidel, City Club member. I have two quick questions. Uh, to Chief Kearns, will your new database include the race, ethnicity, and gender of the officer, the, uh, the police officer? And to both of you, has there been any research done on the types of encounters and the outcome of encounters when the police officer and the person stopped are of the same race, ethnicity, and gender? Uh, the answer to your first question is no. We, we do know the race, gender, and ethnicity of our officers so that we could make that comparison if it's informative. And I, I don't know the answer to the second. I'm not aware of any studies on that. I'm not aware of any either, Karen, and thanks for the question. Um, it's a very interesting issue. Um, and, and one other thing that I, that I should mention is that in the data, in all the data that's been collected in Oregon, uh, the question of the race or ethnicity of the driver stopped by the police officer is based on the perception, the police officer's perception of the person's race uh, or ethnicity. And um, tell you a funny story. Um, the new data collection system that Eugene is putting in place is not the first time this has happened in Eugene. There's been a commitment by a number of police chiefs uh, here in Eugene to implement this system. It's um, it's taken, uh, it's been incredibly frustrating for all of us who care about this issue and for various chiefs of police because uh, for many years, uh, Eugene was dependent on the county airs system, uh, the county uh, law enforcement data system, which was woefully inadequate. Um, and Eugene spent a number of years pouring money into that system to try to improve it finally gave up, went to its current system, and um, was assured uh, by the current provider that they could provide this data profiling uh, on race and ethnicity component within three months of getting the specifications. It's now been, what, a year and a half, Chief? And they it still haven't gotten It went in uh, November of 13. Yeah, so, but they had the specs by yeah. spring of 13. Yeah. Um, so um, anyway, there was a pilot program done by a U of O grad student about 10 years or so ago here in Eugene. And uh, there was community input at that time. And some folks on, on that that were involved in that process felt it was important to ask the drivers their race and ethnicity. Um, I counseled against it at the time. Uh, and that was actually put in place for about 10 days. Uh, and what police officers found was that if they wanted to start an argument with somebody, all they needed to do was ask them to tell them what their race <laughs> or ethnicity was. <laughs> oh, you can't tell that I'm white? <laughs> uh, you can't tell I'm African American? Um, and really what's important from a data analysis point of view is the officer's perception because what we want to know is whether there's implicit bias or actual bias. <coughs> and um, it's really the officer's perception that's most important. Um, a, lot of, a lot of people's actual race and ethnicity can be very difficult to determine. Um, and um, you know, officers are trained to try to determine that, especially if they give a citation. Um, because that's included on the citation. Um, and one last thing directly about your question in terms of the race of officers and ethnicity of officers. Unfortunately, in too many law enforcement agencies, there are too few officers of color to be statistically significant in an individual agency. That's not always true. Um, but it is an area that, that needs to be researched nationally 
um, across agencies to see what um, implicit biases there may be on the part of those officers of color. Bob Cassidy, City Club member, and I think this is a good follow-up question to what you're talking about. When a car is stopped for any reason, tail light or mismanagement of their, their driving, and the police officer approaches the car and he sees a person of color, that's the moment of profiling because we've got two cultures coming together and the driver is looking very nervous. And there's good reason for people of color to be looking nervous when they're being stopped. And that starts the process of profiling and pursuing the possibility of other things. And, and that's, that's where we get into that. What can be done about the training of police to recognize that that person is nervous because of the color of the skin and how it should be handled right at that point. That's the key point of profiling, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the, uh, I, I think the study of implicit bias is going to be helpful. It's like, uh, and maybe this is a bad example, but someone with a poor golf swing and keeps hitting the ball in the, you know, in the woods instead of down the uh, fairway, if they can have a video of that and a professional can tell them where the problem is in their golf swing, then they know it and they can correct it. Uh, but we don't know our implicit biases and it's difficult to learn them, but I think there's ways to do that. If we can be, each of us can be aware of our implicit biases and, and the effect they have on our judgment, then that's where we can perform uh, as well as possible in that encounter that you just described. Um, and then um, I think that, uh, well, the, the, tra the movement that's occurring in law enforcement right now is, uh, is to develop procedures and policies that support a practice of social legitimacy uh, and procedural justice so that um, when an officer walks away from an enforcement encounter, the person that they've just worked with completely understands uh, why the enforcement occurred and uh, they had an opportunity to have a voice in the officer's decision, they were heard, and that the officer made an objective, neutral decision in, in uh, their de enforcement. And uh, that's a, those are uh, techniques that will help us to achieve that and there's training curricula that w is being developed that we'll be applying locally but that has been used around the country. So I think that the belief that the officer's actions are legitimate is important and that's, that's a practice that we need to adopt that improves on that. And then I also think understanding what our individual implicit biases are is crucial to the solution to this issue. Um, if I could just follow up uh, uh, to your question, I think uh, it's important to understand that in many police encounters it's not only the individual who's being stopped that's nervous or is on guard. Um, but police officers need to be on guard as well. Um, it's not that long ago that Chris Cullen was, was killed by a person uh, that he had stopped for, for speeding without any warning, really. Um, and um, when an officer comes up to somebody's window or they walk up to a person on the street, they take with them not just their own demeanor and how they interact, but they have the baggage um, on their shoulders of every police officer that's ever interacted with the person they're stopping. Uh, maybe that person grew up in LA or you know, in Ferguson, Missouri. Uh, with a very different police department. Maybe they've been stopped 10 times in the last two years. Uh, they think for pretext reasons. And maybe they have been. So they're, um, you know, I've been advocating for a long time that police officers need to be more human in their interactions. And I think that's part of what Chief Kearns is talking about in this procedural justice um, movement that's, that's gaining ground now. 
Um, in the past, police officers were trained to be all business, um, to stand a certain way at, uh, when they walk up to a vehicle, um, to um, have eyes in the vehicle to see if there are passengers, if there's anyone in the back seat. There's a lot of stuff a police officer has to do when they're carrying out a traffic stop. A lot of different things they need to be thinking about. And we want one of those things to be how am I being perceived by the person I'm interacting with? And what can I do to make sure that they understand um, the real reason for the stop? There are other policy issues that Chief Kearns and I completely disagree about, I think. Um, you know, the use of pretext stops, um, the, the number of consent searches that are carried out by police officers and under what circumstances. That's the really interesting stuff um, that we need to get into in some of these conversations that are not going to be easily solved because there's a trade-off. Um, you know, less people will be, fewer people will be arrested for crimes, perhaps, um, if we don't do consent searches, uh, if we do fewer pretext stops. But I would argue that trade-off may well be worth it if it helps improve relationships with the community. I'm Jack Rady, um, City Club member, I believe, NAACP. And to solve a problem, you have to recognize there is a problem. And the state has done so by passing this law. Um, the notion that there might be some implicit bias in all of us and thus in every officer, but that's no department tolerates anything beyond that is a good thought, and I applaud the efforts of the department to move in that direction, but I have to say, from talking to people of color in this town, it's seldom I encounter anyone who has not had numerous experiences of being pulled over for nothing, either themselves or their family or their friends. And we have recently seen some incredibly racist outbreaks in police department a little northwest of Eugene where the chief was going around hoo, 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 and is um, scratching his armpits in the squad room talking about a black woman who had been arrested and was you know complaining about it um, so it seems possible to me that we might have one or two people on the department who are maybe a little worse than just a little implicit bias so my question is this if I was one of those officers how would I get around this system how would I use my phone app in such a way as not to reveal the fact that I was deliberately pulling people over based on profiling? You know the answer to that? <laughs> well, uh, we have the benefit of not being the first to uh, run a program like this, and so I'm sure that those lessons have been learned elsewhere. Uh, when we adopted an in-car video, uh, program some years ago, there was um, a history of officers in the United States in some places that uh, would destroy video that embarrassed them. Uh, and so policies forbid that sort of thing, and then the technology wouldn't allow it. Uh, so it's, it's not possible now, uh, at least by me, to know how to technologically affect a video or change a video. Um, and so that's, that's the type of policy we'll have that forbids that sort of thing, and then we'll hope the technology can support it. And as you probably know, we have in-car video in every uh, patrol vehicle, every car, so um, there's other evidence to know uh, what, the, what the demographics were, the people the officer contacted. And we've received a $250,000 grant, matching grant from the federal government to implement a body-worn video system. So we'll have more information than we've had ever before. Kathy King. Um, I have a male Afro-American friend, a Eugene native, who told me he has been stopped dozens of times by police while driving. A question for both of you. With this new state law, how will you be able to prove that the primary intention of the stop is profiling? Well, uh, I think there's two problems. Uh, one is... Um, that the statute talks about solely based on race, et cetera. Uh, that, was a, that was a word that uh, 
the ACLU objected to, but the legislature decided to leave in. I think changing it to primarily would be a big improvement. Um, in terms of the number of stops of individuals, um, and let me just say that one of the other things that the LECC has done, the Law Enforcement Contacts Committee has done over time is to do public opinion surveys of Oregonians with extension samples in the African American community and the Latino community to track attitudes towards law enforcement over time. And um, one of the positive things about the LECC having funding once again uh, is that we'll be able to do another one of those surveys. There are dramatic differences uh, about the perception of police by members of the public based on race and ethnicity. Um, one of the questions we asked of everyone in the survey who'd been stopped by a police officer within the past year was whether they believed the reason that was given for the stop um, was essentially not the truth uh, by the police officer. And among non-Hispanic white drivers, that's the majority of the population, 22% believed the real reason they were stopped was different than what the officer told them. I think that's too high. Chief Kearns wasn't surprised by that number. Among African Americans, and this is the 2009 sample, 78% believe the real reason for the stop was something different than what the officer said. Um, and among the Latino sample, 33% believed the real reason was something different. Now, again, I think part of the problem is pretext stops, where the real reason for the stop really is different than the tail light that's out or the signal that wasn't started at least 100 feet before the intersection or whatever, um, where the officer involved is acting on their instincts and they may be very good instincts uh, because of reported crime in the area or some other factor, they think this vehicle is suspicious. And um, the reality is in every jurisdiction except Portland that collects, that has collected traffic stop data, and Portland's the only exception, um, so I'm talking about the state police, Corvallis, Hillsboro, um, and, and a couple of others, we've not seen a disproportionate number of stops of people of color. Where the disproportionality has happened is after the stop begins and whether or not the vehicle is searched and whether or not evidence of a crime is found. Portland's different. We have seen disproportionate stops in Portland. It's varied somewhat over the years, regardless of what area of the city um, we looked at. And less disproportionality in result of searches. It just runs counter to the trend. So um, that's a long answer to your question. Uh, it's an important question and it's very difficult to prove. Again, I think the most important thing is that the data leads to more questions about what police policies and practices are and why the disproportionality is happening. Hello, my name is Veronica Amaya, City Club member since 2012. Um, my question, well, it's two parts. The first part is primarily dealing with the Hispanic community, which is a group I work with, and um, the, trans the availability of, you spoke about training and training people when they do come in contact with minorities, and being that one of our greatest minorities in the area is Hispanics. Um, what kind of training is being given to officers in assessing the necessity of a translator when dealing with uh, a person that's being stopped. Um, I'd like to know that. And then also, second part of my question, I was curious about this reporting system. I've actually used the auditor's office and written in before, but I found in my experience that there was no follow-through. I felt like I never received any 
closure or conclusion to that auditor report that I did, and I wondered how is that going to change under the new statute and the new method of submitting such complaints. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, the, um, the auditor system does an excellent job of tracking complaints and responding to them, so it's uh, disappointing to know that that was your experience, so perhaps after this meeting we can connect and compare notes and see what happened in that case and see if there's a systems problem that we need to correct. Um, the, um, could you remind me what the second, what the first part of your question was? Training. Oh, the, oh for translators, yeah. Right. We, um, we, the, the training that we used, we use for, um, uh, to prepare our officers for the, for uh, the effects of implicit bias is known as uh, perspectives on profiling and then it's also been amended over time and uh, has the name of uh, ethical decision making, but it was it was designed by the Simon Weisenthal Center in uh, Los Angeles and uh, has u been used by many police departments. And uh, it instructs officers on uh, the definitions of racial profiling or bias-based policing and the effects of implicit bias and, and quite a number of other things. And then it walks uh, the class through a series of decisions in this interactive video. Um, that's used and, is, and uh, encourages conversations throughout the day. It's a, it's a one day uh, training with refreshers. Uh, so that's, that's how we deal with most, that's how we address most of our racial profiling uh, training in our department and I think that's the one that's used throughout most of Oregon, those agencies that use it. Uh, but in terms of uh, recognizing the need for uh, interpreters or translators, uh, that happens as a reminder and training occasionally. They see it in the Recruit Academy and there are resources available both on the street uh, with people, with officers who are qualified as translators and then also through our communications center. Mary Layton, City Club member since 2006. Um, so I grew up in a big family and when there was a bigger kid and an irritating littler kid and no presence of parents, the odds of sin occurring were much higher. Um, so, and I'm wondering if you have found it to be the same with the cameras. Uh, does the presence of a camera, i.e. the parental view, if you will, uh, uh, have a change, does it influence the uh, behavior, do you think, of officers and uh, and alleged perpetrators, or have you had any, I mean, what is the evidence of that now that you've got more of these cameras? Is it, is it helping people behave better, or at least just providing evidence? Well, uh, I'll, I'll use today as an example. Uh, my sentence structure while sitting around a campfire is different than it's been with this microphone in front of me. And, uh, and I think we're all a little more polite when uh, we know the camera's on us and that it's a permanent piece of evidence that can be brought forward at any time. Uh, we haven't analyzed that question, but uh, the most telling information comes from a study in Rialto, California, which showed that uh, the, the necessity for use of force, the use of force declined something like 60% among officers who were using body-worn video when compared to those who weren't. So the, the effect seems to be pretty dramatic. And whether or not that's the officer behaving better or the person they're speaking with behaving better or both isn't entirely understood. Thank you, David Fidanke and Pete Kearns, for bringing clarity and vision to this City Club program, Police Profiling Oregon's Effort to Stop It. Let's give a round of applause for an excellent program. And thanks again to our sponsors, Oregon Country Fair, Friends and Neighbors Realty, and PAC Info. You can watch this program on community television, Cable 29. City Club programs are viewable Sunday night at 9 p.m. and every day at noon. We meet again on October 16th at the Downtown Athletic Club for no, Cutting no, Edge no. Climate Law is Ground Zero in Eugene with guest speakers Tom Bowerman, Project Director, Policy Interactive Research, and Julia Olson, Executive Director and Chief Legal Counsel, Our Children's Trust. Lunches for this program can be ordered on the City Club's website or by contacting the office. Thank you.